bite, your brain, your brain was already signaling to your gut, priming it for action. Uh, it was driving the secretion of acid in your stomach to help to digest the food. It was um, signaling to your pancreas to release insulin, which would actually help to manage glucose levels during and after the meal. Um, and so all this, all this time while you're eating, your brain was actually telling, kind of getting your digestive system to do what it does best. Um, but after you had this healthy breakfast, uh, you decided to take a leisurely swim in the pool. By the way, this wasn't my day, so I hope it's your day. <laughs> I would love for this to be my day. Um, so after your breakfast, you took a leisurely swim in the pool and you, um, the second you dove into the water and your face hit that cold water and you were holding your breath, uh, your heart rate just dropped like a rock. It's one of the most conserved, most robust of all uh, autonomic reflexes. Um, you, it's seen in, in across um, m uh, mammalian species, you know, from mice to rats to, um, uh, to whales, you know, we all have this, this reflex. And what it is, is it, it actually drives down your heart rate and, and shifts blood in your body to your heart and your brain so that uh, allowing you to kind of keep those tissues, those most essential tissues oxygenated uh, while you're um, holding your breath underwater. Um, and interestingly, I should point out too that decrease in heart rate may be the reason why going for a swim is kind of a relaxing thing or you know, even taking a shower, you know, that, that decrease in heart rate could actually impact our stress levels. Um, and then after your relaxing swim, you went to the physicians to have your annual checkup. And the first thing the physician did was to check your heart rate, because as we know, heart rate is uh, resting heart rate is one of the most important indicators of health. And um, when uh, resting heart rate that's too high is, is it um, associated with uh, early mortality, uh, especially after heart attack. So it's, um, it's one of the most important and widely used measures of health. Um, but surprisingly, the, you know, we have only an incomplete picture of how the brain controls resting heart rate. So what all these things have in common is the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, so the parasympathetic nervous system is that branch of your autonomic nervous system that deals with classically called resting and digesting functions. Um, and what, you're, what I'm showing you here is kind of the textbook um, anatomical model of the parasympathetic nervous system. But what, what I want you to notice is that just how much of these functions are controlled by a single nerve. Uh, can you see my pointer okay? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so this one nerve, the vagus nerve, named for uh, the Latin word for the wanderer because it, it's wandering course from brainstem through bowel. Um, it branches, uh, it starts in the, in the brainstem and it branches as it goes down through the body um, and these branches connect with neurons that are found in or around these different visceral organs to control things like bronchoconstriction, slowing heart rate, um, driving uh, motility in the stomach and in the intestines, secretion of acid in the stomach, secretion of, of um, hormones uh, such as insulin from the pancreas and exocrine functions, contraction of the gallbladder. So many, many different important visceral functions are controlled by this one nerve. And somewhat surprisingly, given how much it diverges and how many different things it regulates, it really just starts in two regions of the hindbrain. There's a, a shown here in the schematic. Um, so this is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, or DMV for short. Um, this is the major, paras a major source of parasympathetic output to the digestive tract. And then the nucleus ambiguous, which is the major output to the heart and the lungs, uh, but also contains some motor neurons for the esophagus and the upper airways. So given just how many different functions the vagus nerve regulates and the fact that it's these fibers really start just in two brain regions, it's long been thought there must be like uh, dedicated populations of neurons that do these, that control these different functions. And, uh, and what the big question has been like, is it, really one subtype of neuron that just connects with different organs and mediates a general rest and digest program, or are there kind of discrete channels of information flow from the brain to the viscera? You know, maybe a subtype of neuron that just projects to the pancreas to control insulin secretion and another subtype of neuron that just projects to the stomach to control acid secretion. So it could be, that could be another way that it's organized. Now there's been a lot of anatomical and physiological evidence um, that there are these so-called functional units these populations of neurons that mediate different functions of the efferent vagus. And it really dates back almost 40 years ago to this pioneering study by Terry Pauli's group uh, published in 1985, where they uh, applied a retrograde tracer 
to different branches of the vagus nerve and found that it labeled non-overlapping populations of neurons in the DMV. So if you label, if you apply this tracer to all the branches of the vagus nerve, you can see all the DMV neurons labeled here. Whereas if you just apply it to the hepatic branch, you see these neurons labeled. If you just apply it to the celiac branch, you see these neurons labeled. So um, it really, not only did this show us that different neurons project through different vagal nerve branches, but it also showed us that there's some kind of a viscerotopic organization to this nucleus. Um, and so that a lot of work has been done since then, to try to get a handle on who these different populations of neurons are I and mean, what do they do? Do they have different functions? Do they just project to different organs? How do they work? Um, and so there's this, um, I'm showing you here a figure from a paper published in 2004, where the authors retrogradely labeled DMV neurons that project to the stomach, and then using an antibody for tyrosine hydroxylase showed that most or all of them um, express tyrosine hydroxylase, and so could be you know, potentially dopaminergic neurons. And this, this was a big step forward, realizing, you know, that they had some molecular differences from other DMD neurons, but it kind of wasn't quite enough to, to really say, aha, we found, you know, we've, we've identified the population because other work had shown, as summarized in this review figure from um, Travagme and Ansalmi in 2016, showed that there's actually multiple circuits connecting the DMD to the stomach. Um, at least two, probably three, uh, two of them are shown here. So there's two parallel circuits that are shown both of which are chol uh, cholinergic, so they release acetylcholine onto their uh, target neurons, the postganglionic neurons, in this case in the, in the stomach. Um, one circuit connects with cholinergic stomach neurons to mediate contraction of the stomach, and the other one connects with these non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic neurons, or NANC neurons for short, which relax the stomach's smooth muscle. So it really is, that's kind of where the field is. You know, we're trying to identify who these different populations are and how can we get a handle on them to study them. Um, and so that really, that leads to the work my lab is doing. So we're, we're really interested in understanding how does this one nerve mediate so many different roles, play so many different roles in physiology. Um, are there, you know, do these functional units really exist? Are there maybe molecular subtypes of neurons that um, correspond to these functional units? And if so, how can we target these different units to treat disease? You know, if we could, if we could identify the, the units that projects to the heart to decrease heart rate, you know, could we target that um, as a way to treat people who've, who've suffered from a uh, heart attack? Um, could we target the ones that control acid secretion to help to treat GERD? You know, there's lots of, lots of potential opportunities you can imagine if we could somehow get access to these individual uh, functional units and, and control their activity. All right, so my, my lab likes to take things apart, and that's the approach we took to, to address these questions. We like to take you know, tissue apart into individual cells, the most basic units of the tissue, and figure out how it's put together, how it's connected, and how it works. Um, so we, a lot of our studies really start with kind of getting a sense of who the cells are like in this piece of tissue. And we use, we use single cell transcriptomics for this, where we can profile genome-wide RNA expression in single cells in order to identify cells that have similar gene expression profiles. Um, so we start with the complex tissues such as the DMV or the nucleus ambiguous, isolate single cells or cell nuclei, profile the, the gene expression in those single cells with RNA sequencing, and then we can group them into candidate cell types, groups of cells that have the same or similar gene expression profiles. Um, and then, so it's shown here, these little colorful cells are meant to each represent a different subtype of neuron. Um, and we can then compare these subtypes to find genes that are enriched in each. So say this, this yellow subtype right here might be a very interesting subtype because it has some genes we care a lot about. And we, you might be, wanna know like, what are these, what do these neurons do? Well, we can take advantage of the fact that these are the only neurons in the area that express gene A, all the other ones express other genes. So we can use this as a way to get access to these neurons. We can, for instance, make a mutant mouse line um, where we've inserted a gene uh, that encodes a DNA recombinase called Cree. So we've inserted the Cree recombinase gene into the gene A locus. So that means that in any cell in the mouse's body that expresses gene A will now express this Cree recombinase. Um, and Cree recombinase works kind of like a molecular light switch. We can use it to turn on or turn off the expression of other, other genes. So we could, for instance, use it to turn on the expression of a fluorescent protein that will fill just this subtype of neurons with, um, 
for instance, GFP, allowing us to see where that neuron's axons go. So do they go to the pancreas? Do they go to the stomach? And so on. Um, we can also use the same approach to deliver a light-sensitive ion channel, such as channel rhodopsin, where we can then, by shining the light on these neurons, just activate this one subtype of neuron in the DMV and find out what happens you know, to physiology and behavior when we activate it. Is there a change in insulin release or a change in gastric motility or heart rate? So we took this, we applied this approach to uh, these vagal uh, efferent neurons of the DMV and the nucleus ambiguous. And I'm gonna kind of take you through a schematic now, just briefly on how we did that. Um, so we first, we labeled these uh, e vagal efferent neurons in the DMV and the nucleus ambiguous by using a chat reporter mouse, the chat Cree mouse. So the chat is an enzyme that's used to make acetylcholine and all of these vagal efferent neurons are cholinergic, uh, but few of their neighbors are. So this kind of allowed us to enrich for the population we wanted to profile. Um, and we labeled them with a virus that would pre-dependently express a fluorescent uh, M-cherry protein that was localized to the nucleus, so an h 2 m cherry Then we could dissect out the, the DMV and the nucleus ambiguous. This is just showing you the nucleus ambiguous here um, in, the, in, a, in a section of brainstem. And you can see these are the, the nucleus ambiguous neurons that have been labeled by this um, Cree and the Cree dependent virus. And so I could take out a punch of tissue and then we could um, isolate the nuclei from this tissue, the cell nuclei, and then use a, a fax sorter, fluorescence activated cell sorting, to um, kind of get rid of all the non fluorescent nuclei and just um, capture the fluorescent ones. So we could take a single fluorescent nucleus and then isolate its RNA um, and using a method called SmartSeq2, which basically turns polyadenylated RNA into an amplified uh, cDNA sequencing library we could um, sequence the transcriptomes of these single cells and then analyze them. Um, and so in the analysis, you know, we're, we're looking often at, at tens of thousands of genes um, that we've detected in single cells, but we kind of, it's hard to look at a giant spreadsheet of genes and cells and make some sense of it. We need to kind of compress it down into a, uh, a way we can visualize. So what we do first is we focus on the genes that vary most across the cells. Uh, we're interested in these because these are the genes that are gonna help us to tell the different cell types apart. So we focus on highly variable genes. So we select about 2,000 or so highly variable genes in the, in the data set. And then we, we, then we have a 2,000 dimensional data set, but we can't see in 2,000 dimensions. So we have to smush it down using dimensionality reduction methods, such as principal component analysis um, to kind of reduce it down to two or three dimensions that we can visualize. So we do dimensionality reduction and then cell clustering, and we get a map that looks something like this. So this is a, a UMAP plot and what it is, is a two-dimensional embedding of uh, cells that have been clustered in really high dimensional space. Um, and it's a machine learning algorithm that um, puts cells that have similar, that, that are similar in their expression of these highly variable genes, puts them close together on the plot. So each of these dots is a different cell and it's, they've been placed close in space based on how similar they are in their, their gene expression profiles. So there's 542 single cells here. Not a lot, but just to point out that the DMV only contains about a thousand cells in mouse um, and the nucleus ambiguous is about 500. So these are very small nuclei with very few cells. Um, but this was a, a data set from 542 of them. Uh, and then of course, you know, what do we do with the plot of these colorful dots? We wanna know what, they, what it means, right? So we, we started comparing these subtypes. So each of these little clusters that are differently colored um, these could be a subtype of neuron. Um, and so we wanted to know more about them. So we compared the subtypes to find if they expressed any different genes. Turns out they were very different in terms of their gene expression profiles. Um, I kind of went into this thinking they would all be very similar. They're all cholinergic neurons. You know, they have a lot in common, but it turns out they, they are very different. They have expressed many different types of genes and you can kind of get a sense of that from this heat map. So each column in this heat map is a different cell on this plot and they've been grouped together based on which cluster they're in. So all the cells that are in this cluster are shown in this first bin here. Uh, each row is a different gene and I've selected the genes based on how enriched they are in each cluster relative to the other clusters. So the top 10 cluster marker genes are shown in the first 10 rows and then the top 10 for cluster two are shown in the next 10 rows here. And so what you can see these blocks of yellow these are genes that are highly enriched in one cluster relative to the others. And these genes are very helpful because not only can they 
you know, tell us about who these neurons are and, and generate hypotheses about what they do, but they also can give us access to, to be able to study these neurons. But we were able to confirm that these, uh, these clusters came from the DMV and these three came from the nucleus ambiguous. And these two clusters actually came from, they're not bagel efferent neurons, but they came from a neighboring region, um, which is pretty recently described called PICO. And the reason they ended up in our data set is because they happen to express uh, chat. So that's how we label the cells. And these cells happen to express chat, even though they're not bagel efferent neurons. So I won't talk any more about them. Um, but from these, from these differentially expressed genes, we could find like candidate marker genes. So genes that are like I was showing you before, gene A, B, gene B, gene C, genes that can really give us access um, that we can use, we can leverage to gain access to these different neuron subtypes. Um, and so this is what I'm showing you here is a dot plot. Um, the, each row is a different cluster from here. And I've given them names based on their um, the top marker gene expression and their, the region from which the neurons came. Um, and then the, each column is a different gene. And the, the size of the dot tells you the number of cells in that cluster in which we detected the gene and the color of the dot is normalized expression values. So what you can see in this case, for instance, these, this cluster was the, you know, the only one that expressed this EDN1 gene, whereas this cluster over here was the only one that expressed protonorphin. This one was the only expressed GRP and so on. So these cells really have you know, strong specific markers that we could potentially use to, to um, study these cell types or these subtypes further. Okay, so what I've shown you so far is that we've done a single cell RNA-seq analysis on vagal efferent neurons, and um, they are, we found 10 different subtypes based on their gene expression, but this raised a lot of questions for us. You know, we wanted to know, okay, we know, we know roughly where they are within the DMV and the nucleus ambiguous, but what about those subregions? You know, I, I mentioned before that there's some viscerotopic organization to these regions. Where exactly are these neuronal subtypes located? That may give us some clues to what they do. Um, do they innervate organs? You know, is there a stomach projecting subtype and a heart projecting subtype? Um, and if they do, does that mean they play different roles in physiology? You know, does the one that project to the heart control heart rate and so on? And what, maybe they control some other aspect of heart function. So these are the big questions that we're, we're working on now. And I'm gonna show you some of the progress we've made over the last two years in answering these questions. I've broken it up into two parts. Part one is on the DMV and part two is on the nucleus ambiguous. Um, some of the most of what I'm going to show you today is published recently, but we have um, the final part is all an unpublished project that we're we're wrapping up. Okay, so uh, part one we really started on the DMV. So remember, this is the major output to the digestive tract, um, and this is a this is a project I started with Ken Tao back when I was a postdoc at Brad Lowell's lab. Um, uh, here's Ken and uh, and. Ken and I, were, when we first got this data set, you know, we sat down with it and looked and we thought, well, okay, let's, let's see, you know, which subtypes we can, let's just pick some subtypes and see what they do. And so he happened to, he was really interested in these two subtypes here, these, which we call CCK DMV neurons, and these, which are the protonorphin DMV neurons. And we call them that because these are the only ones that express CCK and these are the only ones that express protonorphin, at least among the um, vagal efferent neurons. So the first thing Ken did was to do some RNA in situ hybridization. He wanted to see, you know, these RNA seq data have kind of come from dissociated cells, nuclei. You know, we um, we don't know anything about the anatomy of these subtypes. So he wanted to see where are these subtypes located within the DMV, um, and he wanted to kind of confirm that they exist uh, in vivo. So he did some RNA in situ hybridization, and I'm showing you the data here. Um, he used a systemically injected tracer called fluorogold that labels all neurons that project outside the blood-brain barrier, including all vagal efferent neurons. So that was kind of our way of seeing the vagal efferent neurons. And then he used RNA probes for um, CCK transcript and protonorphin transcript. And he looked at different levels in the DMV because the DMV is kind of a long nucleus. So he looked at the rostral third, the middle third, and the caudal third of the DMV. And what he saw was, was pretty cool. He saw that in the rostral DMV, that's where you would find these CCK expressing DMV neurons. Um, but as you move back through the DMV, so here's kind of the intermediate DMV, you didn't see any more. Now these are CCK neurons outside the DMV, so we weren't, we didn't really care about those, but you know, we don't see any more CCK neurons in the DMV, but you do start to see protonorphin neurons showing up in kind of the intermediate DMV and also in the the caudal most DMV. 
So this seemed really cool. It was first, you know, showed us that not only are these neurons truly DMB neurons, but they're found in different subregions. And when you quantify the data, it looked like this. Oops. So um, what I'm showing you here is the is the number of cells that were labeled by these different probes as a as a percentage of the total DMB neurons is labeled by fluorogold. And uh, and in cyan are the CCK DMB neurons, and in protein. Um, Magenta are the proteinorphin DMV neurons. And you can see there was, I think there was like one cell that actually expressed both proteinorphin and CCK. So that was nice to see. It kind of confirmed that we thought these were distinct subtypes. And it turns out these genes are mostly, almost entirely um, not overlapping. So the, the CCK neurons were in the really in the rostral um, half of the DMV, whereas the proteinorphin are in the caudal half. And this was interesting because based on um, some functional studies that had been done many years ago, where the, the authors had injected um, uh, glutamate into, uh, had like micro injected glutamate into different parts of the DMV and seen changes in, in stomach pressure. So for instance, they injected glutamate into the rostral DMV where we saw these CCK DMV neurons and that caused an increase in gastric pressure. Whereas when they injected it into the more, whoops, intermediate and caudal DMV, they saw a decrease in gastric pressure, suggesting that these, there may be like antagonistic populations in these different parts of the DMV. So then we wanted to know, well, where do these neurons project? Um, and I'm gonna save you <laughs> from a lot of negative data because we looked at in a lot of different organs. Uh, we looked in the stomach, we looked in the gallbladder, in the pancreas, in the intestines, um, and didn't see any projections to those other, what we did see was projections to the stomach. And the way we did this is we, we took uh, Cree lines for the uh, proteinorphin, proteinorphin Cree and um, a CCK Cree mouse lines. And we injected them with uh, Cree dependent viruses that would express either a fluorescent protein TD tomato or an enzyme called um, PLAP, which is placental alkylene phosphatase. And we use these kind of as anterograde tracers to label the axons of these different uh, DMB neuron subtypes and see which organs they innervate. We saw only projections to the stomach uh, from proteinorphin DMB neurons and from CCK DMB neurons. And what was really striking was the fact that not only do these two DMB neuron subtypes only innervate the stomach as far as we can tell, they both target the same region of the stomach. So this is a flat mount of the, the wall of the stomach. And this, if you label all DMB neurons, you see these beautiful branching axons going throughout the wall of the stomach. Um, if you label just the proteinorphin DMV neurons, you only see axons down here in the glandular part of the stomach. Um, and the same is true for the CCK neurons. So like, wow, what are the chances these two subtypes innervate not only the same organ and only that organ, but the same subregion of that organ? So, uh, and this is, this is, we looked at it another way. We wanted to make sure it's not just some kind of technical artifact. You know, what if we do anterior grade tracing with another method? Can we kind of confirm this? So we use this, um, a, a Cree dependent placental alkylene phosphatase. So this enzyme um, will catalyze a substrate and produce a, like a dark blue reaction product. And so this is a way of, of imaging these axons using bright field microscopy. Uh, and so we repeated these studies using this other approach and, and confirmed what we saw with the, with the uh, fluorescent approach. You could see, so what you can see up here, this is if you label all DMB axons to the stomach. Um, and this is, these are zoomed in views of the non-glandular stomach and glandular stomach. And this is the case, I think I forgot to label these, but proteinorphin and CCK. So the axons of these neurons were only found in the glandular stomach. Here's a zoomed in view of the non-glandular stomach and here's a zoomed in view of the glandular stomach. And you can see these, this kind of like um, meshwork of axons um, and these little, little white holes that you can see, these are actually the cell bodies of stomach neurons that are targeted by uh, these different DMV axons. Okay, so, so they both innervate the same part of the stomach. The next big question was, are they connecting with the same stomach neurons? You know, are they, there's different types of enteric neurons in the stomach, there's excitatory ones that, that release acetylcholine, there's inhibitory ones, there's NANC neurons I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's thought those NANC neurons might release uh, nitric oxide, that might be their inhibitory signal. So we, we using some antibodies and reporter lines, we asked which stomach neurons are these two DMB neuron subtypes innervating? And uh, what I'm showing you here is a data from where we labeled um, 
this is from the stomach. So this is kind of a zoomed in view of the wall of the stomach. We've labeled nitric oxide expressing neurons uh, with an antibody for NOS1. And we've labeled the axons, so that's in green, and we've labeled the axons of proteinorphin neurons in, um, in magenta, so with this TD tomato fluorescent uh, protein. And what you can see is that these, these proteinorphin DMV axons kind of come down right to where these the cell bodies are located of these NOS1 expressing neurons and just wrap around them. Um, and so they seem to be forming synaptic contacts specifically on these NOS1 neurons. You can see it here in the overlay really well. Uh, and in contrast, when we repeated this experiment, but, but instead labeled CCK DMV axons, we saw the total, the complete opposite. We still saw those NOS1 neurons, but you can see these CCK DMV axons are kind of, they're forming these little um, uh, like perisomatic arborizations, and, but they're totally avoiding the NOS1 neurons. They're forming these, these arborizations around neurons that are not labeled with the NOS1 antibody. And so what we quantified, we found that about 89 or 79% of proteinorphin axons targeted these uh, NOS1 uh, enteric neurons, or the complete op the opposite was true for CCK. It was only about 12% of the NOS of their axons targeted NOS1 neurons. So this was interesting. They seem they seem like they may be targeting different subtypes, but who are the CCK neurons talking to if they're not talking to NOS1 neurons? So we used a chat reporter line. This is a, a transgenic mouse that expresses GFP downstream of the chat gene. So this will label cholinergic neurons. And, uh, and we repeated these studies, again, looking at uh, proteinorphin DMV axons and CCK DMV axons in the stomach. And what we found was the complete opposite of with the NOS1. We found that the proteinorphin DMV axons seem to avoid the cholinergic enteric neurons, whereas the CCK DMV axons seem to target them. So here, about 88% of the proteinorphin axons, uh, I'm sorry, 13% of the proteinorphin axons targeted these um, cholinergic uh, neurons for the, but then for the CCK neurons, it's, it's the complete opposite. It's, it's the vast majority of them actually are, are targeting these cholinergic enteric neurons. So in summary, proteinorphin neurons seem to specifically target the, um, nitric oxide expressing enteric neurons, whereas CCK neurons uh, specifically target the cholinergic enteric neurons. So we think we think we can finally put labels on this on this um, figure that's been around for 10 years now. We we think we've identified you know at least one population that innervates the cholinergic enteric neurons and that's the uh, the CCK um, DMV neurons. And then this NANC population we think it expresses nitric oxide. Uh, synthetase NOS1, and we think those are specifically targeted by, um, by the proteinorphin uh, DMV neurons. Okay, so um, now we've been trying to figure out what exactly these circuits are doing. Uh, it's, it, it's been shown that they, they can contract and relax stomach muscle, but we've been trying to figure out the right assay to measure that and not having a lot of success. So that's an ongoing project is really figure out what the function of these, of these parallel circuits are. But we were really struck by the fact that you know we have these two molecularly distinct subtypes of DMV neurons, and they have such just specific circuitry. They're they're you know they both project to the stomach and only the stomach, uh, but in, in to a specific subregion of the stomach where they target functionally antagonistic populations of enteric neurons. So we think we think this has given us some insight generally into how these vagal efferent neurons are organized. Okay, so in a separate project we um, uh, looked at the nucleus ambiguous. So, um, and just to remind you, the nucleus ambiguous is the major um, source of parasympathetic output to cardiorespiratory system. So it innervates the heart, the lungs, the trachea, but it's also home to some um, motor neurons that control the esophagus and the upper airways. So we looked at our, we, um, and previous studies had, had, like the DMV, had suggested that the nucleus ambiguous has some dyserotopic organization. So this is um, from a paper that was published in 1992, where they applied different retrograde tracers to different thoracic organs and tissues um, to see where the nucleus ambiguous neurons that innervate those organs and tissues are within the brain. So what we're looking at here, this is from Rostral McConnell in the rat brain. And they found laryngeal projecting um, nucleus ambiguous neurons are back here in the so-called loose nucleus ambiguous where the cells are kind of scattered around. 
whereas in the opposite end are the um, esophageal projecting um, nucleus ambiguous neurons. These are in the compact nucleus ambiguous where the cells are really densely kind of packed together. The ones that project the heart to the heart seem to be found kind of outside in the, what they call the external subregion of the nucleus ambiguous. So again, it seemed like, like the DMV, it seemed like there was different projection populations of neurons within the nucleus ambiguous, but we didn't really have a handle on who they were, how to get access to them, and whether they had any different functional roles. Um, and it wasn't, you know, this viscerotopic system is not perfect. <laughs> you know, it's not, um, there are exceptions to it. For instance, this study showed that in, um, in guinea pig, at least, um, in this part of the nucleus ambiguous, the compact nucleus ambiguous, you can find neurons that project to the trachea right up next to neurons that project to the esophagus. So it's not, you know, there's, there seems to be some intermingling of different projection populations, even within the subregions. So we really need kind of a better system for, for we need a better way to better handle for these neuron subtypes. So in a project that was a collaboration with, uh, with Steve Abbott, who's in the pharmacology department here, um, and our lab's first graduate student, Tatiana Coverdell, uh, who just been, got her PhD a few weeks ago and finished up, um, and who was co-mentored by, by Steve and I, uh, we wanted to know more about these nucleus ambiguous neuron subtypes. We wanted to study them. So we looked at, we had three clusters of cells in our data set, um, one of which expresses ADYCAP1 gene, which I'm going to refer to as PACAP because that's what the protein encoded by this gene is called, PACAP. Um, CRH, CRHR2 expressing neurons and VIPR2 expressing neurons. So these were three subtypes of nucleus ambiguous neurons that we could see in our RNA-seq data set. Um, here are the expression of those different marker genes. So this is a violin plot. Um, this is the different genes. These are the different clusters that are shown here. And what you're looking at the shape is, is basically it's a cloud of single cell expression values for the gene. And they've been the, the, the violin is just the outline of that cloud, giving you a sense of the data distribution. But what you can see hopefully here is that only this subtype expressed this ADCYAP1 gene, only the subtype expressed CRHR2, and only this one expressed VIPR2. So these are genes that we could use to, to access and manipulate these different subtypes. Uh, and, and just like with the DMV project, we wanted to see where these neurons are located. You know, and, and, and so Tatiana did some RNA fluorescence tissue hybridization, this time looking at these different marker genes. And what she, what she saw was that the, um, the nucleus ambiguous neurons that express CRHR2 seem to be found mostly in the compact region. So if you remember, those, that's where the esophageal motor neurons are found, but also some tracheal um, projecting parasympathetic neurons. So those are in this compact region. Whereas the neurons that express this gene, BIPR2, are found more in kind of the semi-compact and the loose nucleus ambiguous, um, and so could be potentially laryngeal or um, pharyngeal motor neurons. Uh, it was nice to see that even though you know we only have a, a few hundred cells here, when we did uh, RNA fish for these different markers, we found that the markers um, labeled the vast majority of nucleus ambiguous neurons. So even though we know we were only capturing a small minority of these neurons, we think it's a representative minority. Um, there was about 92% of the neurons in the nucleus ambiguous expressed either CRHR2, VIPR2, or ADCYAP1. Um, there is this population of neurons that, um, that we couldn't find a marker for, so we may need to do some more single cell RNA-seq to identify those. And when we plotted out the positions of these different marker genes, we could here again, we could see that those CRHR2 neurons shown in cyan are really just in the compact, whereas the VIPR2 neurons shown in magenta are mostly in the semi-compact and the loose. So this is where the, the pharyngeal motor neurons are, the laryngeal motor neurons, and this is the esophageal motor neurons. That's where they're all located. So this gave us some clues about what these different molecular subtypes of neurons might do. But we next needed to see where these neurons actually project. So we started with the CRHR2 neurons. We got a CRHR2 Cree mouse that we could use to um, target this these subtype, injected a Cree dependent a PLAP virus I told you about before, um, took out um, the esophagus, the trachea, the lungs, the heart, cleared them, and then performed this chromogenic reaction where um, that would basically stain a dark blue all the axons from the the virally infected cells. And then we um, made the organs transparent so we could, we could visualize these axons. So if we did this targeting all nucleus ambiguous neurons and took out basically the whole throat and, and, and uh, made it transparent, we could see these um, 
nucleus ambiguous axons kind of throughout the larynx, the pharynx, and the esophagus, and even some fibers in the trachea, which kind of fits with previous anterior grade tracing studies. Interestingly, though, when we label the axons of the two different of two of the different subtypes, CRHR2 nucleus ambiguous neurons and VIPR2 nucleus ambiguous neurons, we saw totally different uh, projection patterns. So the CRHR2 neurons seem to innervate throughout the esophagus, um, but they didn't provide any input to the pharynx, whereas the VIPR2 neurons selectively innervated the pharynx, but didn't provide any, um, didn't innervate the esophagus at all. So totally non-overlapping um, projections of these two different subtypes. Uh, here's a close-up view of the projections to the esophagus of these CRH2 neurons, and they look strikingly similar to, to what was previously described by Terry Pally's group, um, this paper published in 2013. Um, these neurons seem to connect with both uh, the longitudinal muscle of the esophagus and the circular muscle. Um, and he was using a different, this was more of a classical anterior grade tracing experiment, uh, not using a genetically encoded tracer. Uh, okay, but the next thing, so we, so we found a subtype that innervates the esophagus, another subtype that innervates the pharynx, but do they actually control these muscles? You know, we need, to be, we need a way to be able to activate these neurons and measure muscle function to know that. So um, it turns out they're, they're rather tricky neurons to infect with viruses. We have a few viruses that will infect these neurons, but most of the ones we use elsewhere in the brain don't actually work on vagal efferent neurons, and that's really been a challenge. Um, so we've had to resort to using intersectional genetics um, to get the specificity we want, and then uh, intersectional genetics mouse lines, such as this catch mouse. So catch, this is a mouse that was created by Hong Kui Zhang's lab at the, uh, the Allen Institute. Catch is a light sensitive ion channel. Um, and uh, when, it's, when you shine blue light on it, it opens up and allows sodium and, um, and calcium into the neurons, causing them to be activated. Now, this mouse will only express the catch um, after recombination by both Cre and FLIP. So we, we needed um, a combination of genes to target this catch expression to the, just the subtypes we wanted to manipulate. And, um, and so what I'm showing you, at the, this, is, this is the schematic of how it works. So the catch gene gets expressed after these stop cassettes are removed by, by, by Cre recombination and FLIP recombination. And what I'm showing you at the bottom here, these are the different mouse lines we use. So a chat, Cree, fox to be flip, catch. This would put catch in all um, nucleus ambiguous neurons, uh, whereas the VIPR2 chat, VIPR2 Cree, chat, flip, catch. This would only express in neurons that have both VIPR2 and chat. So you, you get the picture. Um, the idea was that we knew that, you know, the the different um, marker genes we were using and the corresponding Cree lines were expressed outside the nucleus ambiguous. So we needed this uh, um, intersection in order to get the specificity we want. Um, and this would allow us to just activate the subtypes of neurons within the nucleus ambiguous uh, and not any of the neighboring cells. And here's, uh, here's some histological validation. So what I'm showing you here, uh, we've labeled, um, this is from a chat Cree fox to be flip catch mouse. Um, and what we're looking at, this is the, the uh, compact part of the nucleus ambiguous. And the green that you can see here is that catch expression. And there's uh, essentially no catch expression outside the nucleus ambiguous. Um, you do find it in other motor regions. So it is in the DMV, for instance, facial motor nucleus. But we're able to avoid those by putting just our, our optical fiber just over the nucleus ambiguous. So we're just activating the neurons there. Um, OK. So now we, we, have a, we have an approach we can use to selectively activate these CRHO2 nucleus ambiguous neurons. Um, and we anesthet we made these CRHO2 Cree chat flip catch mice. Um, we anesthetized them, um, intubated them, and then put an esophagus down and uh, put a balloon down into the esophagus so we could actually record changes in esophageal pressure while we photostimulated the axons. And we, we either put an optical fiber over the nucleus ambiguous to stimulate the cell bodies, or in some cases we put the fiber optic directly over the esophagus to, to stimulate the axon terminals there. Um, so this is just kind of comparing those two approaches. Uh, what we're looking at, this is the pressure of that balloon we've inserted down into the esophagus. And so you can see when we shine a blue light, uh, either 
centrally, so on the cell bodies or down here just on the esophagus, we get an increase in esophageal pressure. And then if we're doing pulse simulation, you can see that there's time locked increases in esophageal pressure with each, uh, each flash of blue laser. This effect goes away though, when we give a drug that blocks um, uh, acetylcholine signaling. So we've, this is a uh, acetylcholine dependent uh, mechanism. Okay, just to give you a sense of what this looks like, I have this quick video where we've shown you um, the mouse's esophagus. This is the fiber optic. I'm gonna play the video. What you're gonna see are flashes of, of blue light. And you can actually see this part of the esophagus really well as it twitches with each flash. So hopefully you can appreciate that that this part, its esophagus is basically shortening um, in response to the laser flash. So we recorded videos from uh, diff the different genotypes of mice. Um, and what we found is that we only got these esophageal contractions when we were activating all nucleus ambiguous neurons or just the CRHR2 neurons. We didn't see, so in blue, this is showing you the number of esophageal contractions per flash of laser. And we have these blinded reviewers that, that went over the videos, not knowing what the genotypes were and just said, you know, how many, how many esophageal contractions do they see with each laser flash? And um, for the uh, mice in which we were stimulating all nucleus ambiguous neurons, it was every time there was a laser flash, there was a contraction. And the same was true for the CRHR2 nucleus ambiguous neurons. But when we stimulated them, uh, the VIPR2, that other subtype of nucleus ambiguous neurons, we didn't see any, any contraction whatsoever. So those neurons don't seem capable of contracting the esophagus, but the CRHR2 nucleus ambiguous neurons are. Okay, I know we're running short on time, but I wanted to finally get into the last section of the talk, and this is about heart rate. Um, so you may be wondering, what about those other uh, nucleus ambiguous neurons? Those are the ones, you know, it innervates the heart. It's, uh, it's the um, thought to be the major site of control for resting heart rate. Um, so it's been a big interest of ours to figure out, you know, who are the neurons and the nucleus ambiguous that innervate the heart um, and what did they do? Um, and so we had some clues from the literature about who these neurons might be. Um, this was from a study, I think in guinea pig uh, cardiac ganglia. Um, so in this study, they, um, they took out the, the guinea pig heart and they labeled um, the cardiac ganglia with antibodies for PACAP which is encoded by the ADCYAP1 gene and CHAT, which it marks all cholinergic and therefore parasympathetic axons. And what they saw was that all the, the parasympathetic axons that innervate these um, ganglia um, generally express PACAP. And so, um, uh, but interestingly, another study showed that they don't express a different neuropeptide called CGRP, which is encoded by the CALCA gene. So this, in this study, they retrogradely labeled heart projecting neurons in the nucleus ambiguous, and which you can see here, and this is in the same tissue uh, where they've, they've um, labeled immunoreactivity for CGRP. So the heart projecting nucleus ambiguous neurons do not express CGRP, although the other nucleus ambiguous neurons seem to. So we wanted to know, is there a nucleus ambiguous subtype in our data that expresses PACAP for the ADCYAP1 gene, but not CALCA? And it turns out, yes, there was. Um, so that the subtype I've been calling PACAP neurons, um, they express this gene. The other, the VIPR2 and CRHR2 neurons do not. Um, and the, these PACAP neurons do not express EGRP. So it kind of fits with you know, the literature that these may be the heart projecting uh, nucleus ambiguous neurons. Um, I should mention, you know, in the beginning, we had a lot of different markers for this one population, and we kind of got tried to get our hands on every um, mouse line that we could that would give us access to this subtype. So I'm going to show you data from different mouse lines, but they all the marker genes seem to be expressed by the same subtype. So um, there's this other gene TBX3, which is which is um, known to be expressed also in cardiac tissue. Um, but it's expressed in this one subtype. And then MPY2R, which encodes the MPY receptor type two, also seem to be specific to this one subtype of neurons. So I'm gonna kind of use these, use these markers interchangeably because we use different tools uh, to, to uh, manipulate these neurons. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is we did some in-situ hybridization and looked at, you know, at the expression of these different marker genes and they're expressed by a very small minority of nucleus ambiguous neurons. You know, it's probably, we counted up uh, a total of um, it's about 9% of the, the nucleus ambiguous neurons express MPY2R or PACAP. 
Um, it looks like MPY2R is expressed by um, more broadly and PACAP might be a subtype um, or a subset of the MPY2R neurons, um, but it's a small minority of the nucleus ambiguous overall, which is not too surprising because other studies have shown that even though it's such an important subtype, um, these heart projecting neurons, they um, have powerful control over heart rate. There's not a lot of them. Um, and what I've shown you here, the data that this uh, analysis is based on, uh, so this is some fluorescence in situ hybridization data where we're looking at um, the expression of, of the PACAP gene and MPY2R. And you can see just a, a few of these cells. So here's one here. Notice it's kind of in the external part of the nucleus ambiguous. That's where we mostly we saw these neurons, but there's also kind of some scattered back in the loose nucleus ambiguous. Um, now to see where they project, do they actually project to the heart like we, we um, uh, hypothesized? We used a, a Cree line, TBX3 Cree, that would allow us to fluorescently label the axons of these neurons. We injected into the nucleus ambiguous and, uh, and then took out the heart and cleared it with iDisco. And here, this is not like a full three dimensional view of the heart. This is taken with a confocal where we could only image uh, um, basically the dorsal surface of the heart. Um, but, and there's a lot of background. I should mention the heart's a very difficult organ to clear, but hopefully you can appreciate that over this background, you can see all these brightly colored little magenta squiggles. So these are TD tomato labeled axons from these TBX3 or the, um, these uh, cardiovagal neurons. And they seem to be going to potentially ganglia uh, on the atria up here, but also to the ventricles, which, which surprised us. Um, is it still not kind of clear within the field whether these uh, nucleus ambiguous neurons directly innervate the ventricles and control ventricular function. Okay, so they innervate the heart. Um, and we didn't see this, by the way, with the other subtypes, the CRHR2 or VIPR2 neurons. So this seemed to be the only subtype that innervated the heart. But now we wanted to know, do they control heart rate? You know, it's possible they control some aspect, of, other aspect of heart function, we don't know. But we wanted to know, do they control heart rate? So we did the, we, um, uh, connected the mice to a regenerated mice that would express catch just in this one subtype of nucleus ambiguous neuron and connected them to an ECG system where we could monitor their heart rate and, and awake behaving conditions. And so this is a, a mouse in a plethysmography chamber. It's, it's a closed system that also allows us to measure uh, changes in, in external pressure as a kind of a readout of respiration. I'm not showing the respiration data here, um, but, um, but just going to show you the, the ECG data. So here's a trace of this ECG trace and um, quantification of heart rate here. Um, and what you can see is the mouse normally has a, has a heart rate around 500 to 700 beats per minute. But when we turn the laser on, heart rate just drops like a rock to um, about 50% of what resting heart rate is. Um, and then as soon as we turn the light and it stays down, surprisingly for 10 seconds at a time, oops, sorry. Um, and then as soon as we turn the laser on, off it comes back up. We don't see this in mice that lack expression of catch. So it's not due to like the, uh, the light warming up the tissue. You know, it seems to be due specifically to the activation of catch. Um, and we see it with, um, uh, we only see it with the activation of this, this one subtype, the cardiovagal subtype. Um, if you activate all nucleus ambiguous neurons, you get about a 50% decrease in heart rate. Um, if you just activate the PACAP neurons, you also get a big decrease. If you activate the MPY2R neurons, also a big decrease. But we don't see any change in heart rate when we activate um, the CRHR2 nucleus ambiguous neurons. So those are the esophageal projecting ones or the VIPR2 nucleus ambiguous neurons. So those innervate the pharynx and larynx. Uh, we next wanted to know, okay, so the neuro these neurons are capable of, of suppressing heart rate, driving down heart rate. Um, are they involved in any of these cardiac reflexes? Like I, I mentioned in the beginning, the diving reflex. Um, so that is a system. Um, these are some data from a, a voluntarily diving rat where they, uh, they implanted a blood pressure probe in these rats so they could monitor uh, blood pressure as, as the animal dove underwater. And what you see is here's the prior to the dive. Um, and as soon as the, the rat goes underwater, heart rate just um, it drops dramatically. And then when, when the animal emerges from the water, heart rate comes back to normal. So it's a very striking phenotype and it involves uh, a sensory system. So the trigeminal um, nerve that senses the feeling of cold water on the face. 
uh, combined with the sensation of apnea. So when you hold your breath, those two things trigger a reflex circuit that involves cardiovagal neurons in the nucleus ambiguous and their projections to the heart to slow down heart rate. So we wanted to know, you know, are these, these neurons that we've identified that can, can decrease heart rate, are they activated by voluntary diving? So lucky for us, we recruited a, um, an exceptional uh, undergraduate student, Veronica, who was, who was given a Herculean task of developing a mouse, a mouse diving model and teaching the mice how to dive. And she, <laughs> she, she rocked, it. it was great. She figured out, she actually made a little mouse swimming pool. She, she figured out how to train them to do this. She got in touch with experts in the field to get advice. Um, and, and all of them I'm gonna show you is from her. Um, so this is a video she made um, of one of her diving trials. So she had, she had trained these mice to dive. She has about 100% success rate over the course of six days. All the mice learn to dive. Some are better than others, but they all learn it. Um, so I'm gonna show you an example here of a mouse that's been trained to dive underwater. Um, and it's, she teaches them to dive over longer and longer distances. So this is like a full length dive that she's gonna do. So we have a warming chamber because they do multiple rounds of diving. Here she is putting it into her custom mouse swimming pool and the mouse is swimming under these little plastic guards uh, to be able to get out of the water. And she then takes the mouse out, puts it back in the warming chamber and they kind of puts them through multiple trials of this. So we wanted to know, you know, if, if these nucleus ambiguous neurons we're studying, if they're, you know, are they involved in the diving reflex? Are they activated when the mouse goes underwater, you know, as you predict from the circuit? Um, and so we use the uh, transcripts for the immediate early gene FOSS to visualize um, or to see which neurons were activated as a result of diving. So, so Veronica did a bunch of these dive tests where the mouse dive dove over and over and over again. And then she let them uh, wait for about 30 minutes and, uh, and then we, we um, sacrificed the animals, perfused them to look at FOSS expression in the nucleus ambiguous as a readout for neuronal activation. Um, as for controls, um, we, we would dive, she'd go tra train the mice to dive, but then instead of putting them in water where they would dive underwater, she would put them kind of into the same chamber where there was only enough water to wet their paws. So they were, they kind of went through the same experience, but they didn't have the, um, submersion underwater. So that was what was different. Um, so in the voluntary diving mice and control mice, that's what I'm showing you here, some in-situ images from the nucleus ambiguous. Nucleus ambiguous neurons are labeled in blue, and then in red are the um, MPY2R transcript, and in green is FOSS. And here um, you can actually, it's hard to see at this level, but if you were to zoom in really close, you could actually see uh, green uh, transcripts, the FOSS transcripts in both of these MPY2R neurons, which we don't see in the control condition. So here in the control condition, here's an MPY2R nucleus ambiguous neuron, here's another, and there's no FOSS uh, transcript at all in them. Um, and so here's the quantification of the data and what you can see. So the, the population that, um, uh, the purple, so these are the uh, nucleus ambiguous MPY2R neurons in the control condition. So no FOSS, but then um, with voluntary diving, you see an increase in their FOSS expression. And it's, it's a statistically significant increase in the number or the percentage of, of these neurons that express FOSS um, uh, with voluntary diving. So based on this, we conclude that they, these neurons are activated by voluntary diving, uh, which kind of fits with this the idea that they might be part of the circuit through which um, the diving reflex works to decrease heart rate. Okay, we still have a lot of questions though to answer. Um, and I'll hopefully get to yours in just a, just a second. This is the final slide. Um, but what I've shown you so far is that there are molecular subtypes of neurons that we think are the functional units of the, of the efferent vagus. Two subtypes, the CCK DMV neurons and proteorphin DMV neurons, both innervate the, the, um, uh, uh, the stomach, but they seem to connect with uh, the antagonistic population. So do they play opposite roles in stomach function? Is there, does one contract the stomach and the other one relax the stomach? We don't know yet, but uh, we're working on that. I also showed you um, data that the CRHR2 nucleus ambiguous neurons, um, I say induce swallowing, but I guess it's more accurate to say that they drive the contractions of the esophagus. So we don't actually, you know, when we activate these neurons, we get just this whole contraction across the whole esophagus. So it's not the peristaltic contraction you get with actual swallowing. So I should, <laughs> I need to correct that. Um, but do these neurons sequentially activate during swallowing? So perhaps they, you know, one, perhaps they project to different parts of the esophagus and that they fire in a certain order and that's what creates that peristaltic wave. 
So we'd love to know if that's if that's uh, what happens. Uh, we'd also want to know more about these these cardiovascular neurons. So the MPY2R nucleus ambiguous neurons. We've seen that they innervate the heart. We've shown that they they are capable of suppressing heart rate and that they are activated or at least express CFOS in response to voluntary underwater diving. So are, but are they necessary? You know, are they, are they really necessary for control of rested heart rate and for the decrease in heart rate that occurs with diving reflex? So those are really important questions we wanna answer next. Okay, so uh, these are all the people that did the work. Um, it was, I mentioned Ken, who was a graduate student uh, when I was a postdoc in the Lowell Lab. Tatiana was our first uh, graduate student in the lab, it was co-mentored by Steve Abbott. Uh, shown here, uh, Veronica, who did the, all the diving um, reflex work. Um, Steve, who's been a longtime collaborator, is the physiologist in this. I, I have no experience with physiology, but fortunately, he's, he's an expert. Um, and he was trained with Patrice Guillenet and Ruth Cernetta um, and has, has taken over the lab basically for them. Um, uh, Linus Sai was my bioinformatics mentor. Uh, Steve Lieberlis and Sarah Prescott, who share a lot of tools with us and so on. Um, and I want to thank you two for, for your time, um, and I'd love to take any questions you have. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, John. That was a fantastic talk. Really, um, so much interesting stuff going on. So, yeah, um, we, have some, uh, we have some time for questions. So if anyone has a question, um, feel free to raise your hand or uh, if you prefer, you can type your question in the chat box and um, <coughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we're, we'll be happy to discuss any questions. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I can start, start off the discussion. So um, I wanted to ask you about like, um, so you, you, talk, you talked a lot about the uh, different efferent functions of these um, neurons in the DMV and nucleus um, ambiguous. So what, so for example, in the case of the uh, diving reflex that you talked about at the end, what kind of, uh, and, and you talked uh, as well about the sensory inputs uh, that initiate that reflex. So what kind of like anatomically, what kind of inputs does, does the nucleus ambiguous get? Like where does that information come from to initiate the- yeah, that, that's a great question and something we want to address by tracing back from these neurons to see exactly where the inputs are coming from. But from other studies have shown that the, the heart projecting nucleus ambiguous neurons get input uh, primarily from the nucleus tractus solitarius or the NTS, which is just a major clearinghouse for, for autonomic um, signaling, uh, but also from the, uh, a region called the MDH. Um, and that seems to be important for um, uh, relaying the signaling from the trigeminal nerve. So the sensation of water on the face um, and that, you know, that, that is part of what triggers the diving reflex seems to come through that circuit. We do have some rabies uh, tracing data where we used a monosynaptic rabies virus to trace back from nucleus ambiguous neurons. And we do see neurons in the MDH and in, in the MTS, but that was, that was where we traced from like all nucleus ambiguous neurons you know we still need to do from like the di different subtypes and that's a big question too is we want to know do these different subtypes get inputs from different sources but we think we think the information for the diving reflex is coming via the nts and the and the mdh cool thank you um we have a question from mark evans do you want to unmute Great. <clears throat> so thank you. That that was fantastic. So um, so a question about the um, what do you call the pack up neurons and the heart. So it looked as though the um, the innovation is quite widespread in the heart. So just wondering, and it's certainly more more widespread than just the pacemaker, for example. So do you see any other cardiac effects on you know inotropic effects or AV tran transmission or anything else other than just slowing the heart rate? I haven't looked yet, but that's a great point. Given the, given the that innervation pattern, you'd think it's doing going to do more than just heart rate. Um, we think actually, you know, we may we may be just looking at the tip of the iceberg too when it comes to the subtypes. Uh, we've the data I showed were from basically a, it was a pilot study, but we've we've can, we've gone on to do more single cell RNA seq of these neurons, and we think there may be three subtypes of cardiovascular neurons. Um, all of which express TBX3, which is, that was the gene that we used to label their projections to the heart. But one of them expresses MPY2R, um, actually two of them express MPY2R, the other one, one of them expresses PACAP. So there seems to be some diversity even within that subtype. 
And, you know, we'd love to know, do these different subtypes maybe regulate different aspects of heart function? Could there be a chronotropic and ionotropic subtype? Um, unfortunately, I have no, <laughs> no training in, in heart physiology at all, but I've been fortunate to, to there's access to um, uh, people to do study the heart here. And, you know, we're, we're trying to set up um, assays to look at those, to answer those questions. But um, yeah, lo I'd love to know myself. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Um, another question from uh, Rita. Hi, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering in, in the first part of the of the talk, when you when you show that those neurons, they go to different regions of the DMV, I was wondering if uh, you know what is the consequence of impairing that stratification and if this is actually impaired in any disease context or not. Oh, that's a great question. So like if, if you were to some disrupt the viscer topic organization, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't know of any diseases where that happens, but I think that's, that's probably a, a big frontier in this field is, is understanding how the system develops. You know, I think, I think there's still a lot of important questions about, you know, it, it develops very early. So it's embryonic, um, uh, very early in the mouse, at least that, that these, um, vagal efferent neurons project through the vagus nerve and make contact with the different targeted neurons, but we don't know yet how they kind of develop this viscerotopic organization. You know, is that, is that, you know, do, do they kind of connect with all organs and then some of them, some of the projections die off and others remain? And is that viscerotopic organization kind of a, uh, just a, um, an outcome of, of the ones that remain, I guess. I, yeah, I really don't know, but that's a great question. Uh, I think we're, cool. we're hoping that with these tools, we can we can start to look at, you know, how the system gets to be what it is in the adult, but we, we haven't looked yet. Cool. Yeah, so we have a question in the chat here from Elijah. So he asks, uh, he says, really great talk, especially love the diving videos. So it's a follow up to my question. Um, so Elijah asks, uh, says, recent work from Chen Ran and the Liebelis lab showed that second order sensory neurons in the NTS can be broadly tuned to diverse stimuli from the same organ. Interestingly, they show that NTS neurons can receive information from distinct organs. So how do you think that uh, nucleus ambiguous DMV efferents integrate this information from various NTS subtypes to achieve organ or functional specificity? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a great question. I um, I'm really not sure. It's you know we we we're hoping we can kind of work out this. The NTS has been um, it's such a complex region, um, but we're we're hoping that with tracing back from these different nucleus ambiguous subtypes, we can we can figure out who the sources of input are within the NTS. Like who are the NTS neurons that are talking to these different nucleus ambiguous subtypes? But it's going to be a yeah, figuring out exactly how they kind of make sense of the information they're getting through these different channels is a is a um, much bigger question. I yeah, I sorry, I don't have a good answer yet. But yeah, that's okay. Um, and one last question from Elijah. So he also asked, did you find efferent projections to other cell types in the periphery, for example, interstitial cells of Cajal in the stomach? Oh. So are we, do we see projections to, um, no, I don't know. We haven't looked yet. Um, we've been, we've been kind of looking, our strategy so far has been to look at like an organ level. Um, so we will, you know, put an anterior grade tracer in, in the subtype and then, you know, take out all the different organs that they might innervate and clear them and visualize the projections. Um, that work has actually been very slow because each of the organs kind of has its own conditions uh, for clearing and imaging. So it's been, you know, we spent a year just trying to figure out how to innervate the projections or how to image the projections to the pancreas. Finally got it to work, but it was, it was not easy. Um, so we've, the, I think the next step is getting down within the organs. So once we've, we've identified that the subtype innervates, you know, the stomach or the pancreas. Now, the next question is which neurons within the, these um, tissues is it? And we're not, we're not quite there yet. So we've, you know, the stomach was an exception. We were able to um, uh, kind of identify those postganglionic neurons uh, with, with antibodies and reporters. But, um, but for the other tissues, um, we just haven't, uh, haven't got that far yet. Yeah, that makes that's a, sense. That's a good, that's cool. a good one to look for. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right. So, um, 
Yeah, so let's uh, wrap up there. I think w ordinarily we'd have a Zoom session now after a separate session after the talk, but uh, since we ran over a bit, um, let's uh, skip that because um, I've got to get going for my lab meeting. Um, but uh, thanks again so much, John, for joining us. It was a really fantastic talk. It's really nice to hear about what you've been up to um, since leaving Boston. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you again um, <clears throat> next year, so watch out for information about the, the next talks that we'll have. And um, yeah, have a great uh, holiday season. Um, see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. It's good seeing you again. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Bye, John.